Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Genocrypha. I am Noel, being joined, as often, by JD. Hey, how's it going? We are starting a special series of episodes looking at various Halloween peripheral things. We're recording this episode in November 2018. Last month was the release of the brand new 2018 Halloween movie in theaters. And the plan is to record and release an episode actually discussing that Halloween film for next October, October 2019. We've seen it, we've even chatted about it a little bit, but we want to stew on that movie a little more, get a little more divided from the initial hype and everything, so we can actually fully process it as a film before we record a discussion. So October 2019 is when that's planned. However, we have a whole lot of other Halloween apocrypha. It's our genocrypha apocrypha (laughs) for Halloween that we figure, hey, let's finally cover some of that stuff as a lead-in. We're going to get to the Rob Zombie films, unfortunately. We've got a bunch of unproduced scripts that we're finally going to look at. I want to talk about there were three original Halloween novels that were released in the 90s. You know, when young adult thrillers suddenly became popular again, and suddenly there was like Freddy's Nightmares. There was a Friday the 13th young adult thriller series. There was also one done for Halloween. I do have all three of those books, but that's not going to be a part of this set. We'll do those again later down the road. I got to figure out how to get a copy for JD because they're very expensive. Yeah. And I own a copy and I'm not going to wreck their spines by scanning them. (laughs) But we'll cover those later down the road. But still, we've got a lot of Halloween stuff coming up here over the next months. So you thought Halloween was over, but just Mm -hmm. you wait. Wait, just you Eight wait. Four months of Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. <laughs> From Masters of Carpentry. And JD. And JD. You're officially a part of Masters of Carpentry now. You've been doing enough of it. Okay, cool. So what we're discussing on today's episode is Halloween 4 as written by Dennis Etchison. Now, a little bit of history to this one. Dennis Etchison, is he an author that you have any familiarity with? No, not before reading this. I know he's not one of the major A-list horror writers, but he's someone who has a very strong cult following. A lot of horror writers are themselves fans of him. He's kind of like an author's author. Primarily a writer of short fiction. Done a ton of short stories. A lot of them have won awards. In 1982, he released an anthology called Dark Country. The anthology won the British Fantasy Writers Award and the actual main story, Dark Country, won the World Fantasy Award. It tied with Stephen King. I can't remember for what story. So he is someone with some level of prominence in the field, and he's someone that we have run into in the past because he is a friend of John Carpenter and wrote the novelization of The Fog under his own name, and then under the pseudonyms Jack Martin, he wrote the novelizations of Halloween's 2 and 3. Okay. Now, however, it's also mistakenly printed on the internet that he wrote the novelization of the original Halloween under the name Curtis Richards. Curtis Richards is an actual literary agent named Richard Curtis who actually has an essay about his writing of the novel on his website. So the original Halloween novel was not written by Dennis Etchison, despite what half the internet wants you to believe. (laughs) That's kind of that same half of the internet that thinks Big Trouble in Little China started as a sequel to Buckaroo Banzai. Okay. No, it did not. Yeah, yeah. Do you mean the internet was wrong about something? The internet was not only wrong about something, but a whole lot of other people believed the wrong thing and spread it. I'm disappointed with you, internet. You go back to your room right now. See, this is what happens when we don't vaccinate our kids. <laughs> yeah. And we don't vaccinate our kids because of rumors on the internet. <laughs> so Dennis Hutchinson was a friend of John. I don't know when this project began, but there's two drafts of the screenplay for Halloween 4. I sent you the third draft, which was written in January of 1987. But I also read a second draft of the screenplay, which was written in December of 1986. So I'm guessing it was probably around mid-86. This was a time when John was not having a good time in the industry Hmm. because John had just had the one, two, three punch of The Thing, Starman, and Big Trouble in Little China being his big studio movies, all three of which bombed. And when you get like that many bombs in a row, your Hollywood career has come to an end for a while. 
The Halloween series, Halloween 2, did pretty decently, but Halloween 3 was a bomb. So John kind of needed a win. Mm -hmm. He had other projects that failed to come together. Halloween's 2 and 3 were produced by Universal Studio, who he was not getting along with, because they were also the ones that kicked him off a Firestarter after the performance of The Thing. Things were not going well. Mm -hmm. So John was like, okay, fine, fuck it. What makes money? Michael Myers made me some money. Let's bring back Michael Myers begrudgingly. He batted the idea around with Dennis Etchison on how to go about doing that. Dennis had an idea and John was like, go ahead, flesh it out. And as we said, they went through at least three drafts of the screenplay. However, when the screenplay was actually distributed to financiers, not only were the people at Universal not eager to produce this movie, but the Akkads really disliked this script and rejected it. And so ultimately, John threw his hands in the air and sold. This is when John sold his chunk of the ownership of Halloween to the Akkads. And they went off and did Halloween 4 without him and even brought it to another studio. And then that bounced around studios. And then after Halloween 5, there was this whole big legal battle over John and New Line tried to buy the rights back to Halloween. But then the Weinsteins and Miramax swooped in and bought the rights back. And a whole lot of drama came out of this. And then John got a three-picture deal with a studio that produced Prince of Darkness and They Live, but found out that then the distributor for those films was Universal. After he did those two movies, they reneged on the additional films of the contract, and he spent several years in a legal battle with them, which is why there's like a four-year gap in films between They Live and Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Because John was not only trying to get the Halloween rights back, but he was fighting the courts over this other film that never got made. And so it was just John in the late 80s, early 90s was not in a good place. Yeah. So anyways, they had this script. Now I found out John was not himself going to direct the script. John and Deborah Hill were themselves producing this together. But their director that they had in mind was Joe Dante. Oh. Now Joe Dante started in low budget horror with Piranha and the Howling, but Gremlins had exploded. Mm -hmm. Like in 1984... Gremlins made $150 million against a $10 million budget. Unfortunately, Joe Dante then was struggling. Twilight Zone, the movie, had all of its controversy. Mm -hmm. Explorers bombed hard. Amazon Women on the Moon. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't do very well. So you could see that even though he was already shooting up into a successful career, he was himself in a slum. So I think that's why he might have been willing to do a, let's do part four of a franchise. Mm -hmm. Though pretty soon it seems like he had already then started working on Inner Space. And by the time he gets to 87, Inner Space came out and was a not a huge hit, but it was enough to get him back his footing in the industry. So this was a project that was kind of doomed yeah. from all angles. Sounds like it. We're going to break up the synopsis into some chunks because it's a very complicated story to get through. Let me just ask you, JD, you read the third draft. I read the second and third draft. I will say there's not that much difference. Like over 90%, the drafts are identical. There's a couple of key changes, mostly because it's like they hope to get back certain actors that they probably realized we couldn't. Mm -hmm. Like Dr. Loomis is in the second draft, but he's not in the third. Okay. It's a small part. It's not like anything really changed. Mostly it's just a cleaning up. The second draft is still largely the same script, but it was a lot messier and a lot looser and even harder to read. <laughs> okay. So it's basically just, I think it went through some notes and some polishes, but not really that much changed. So I'll ask you, JD, did you enjoy reading Dennis Etchison's Halloween 4 and would you have liked to have seen it filmed? Ah, uh, that is a good question. I enjoyed a good chunk of it. I think I would like to see it just to see what type of film it would have come out to be. There's a lot of things in here that I think would have been really difficult to film in 1987. But overall, I didn't love the final script that much. I think that there, there's a lot of problems in this that I think would have made it difficult to finish as the script stands. Yeah. No, I, I didn't like the script at all. There's some nuggets in there. There's a few good scenes. There's some really good nuggets of ideas in there. The basic concept is interesting, but it is not a well-written script. It's just too loose. It's too disparate. It's too misfocused. It just has no real idea where it's going. <laughs> and then by the time you get to the end, it's like a whole lot of shit happens and none of it really makes any sense. Yeah. And none of the characters are developed or interesting. It's just, again, it's like by the third draft, it still feels like they're struggling to find a first draft. To be honest, when you said, like, I gave you the third draft, I was like, you mean that wasn't the first draft? Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, a lot of the dialogue just feels very rote. The dialogue was even worse than the second draft. <laughs> that went through some John tweaks. You can feel a little bit of John in the tweaking of the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. 
And then just the craziness that we'll get to eventually. Yeah. There's some cool social commentary that if it had been developed just a little bit more, could have been really interesting. I think if you had taken it in a completely different direction, it would have been interesting, but it's just not working in the way that they're going. Oh, yeah. It doesn't really pay off in the end. But yeah, it's one of those scripts where it's like, I'm surprised that it went three drafts without fixing the... Like, I read the second draft first, and I'm like, oh, this needs work. This needs... Oh, poor baby, you need help. <laughs> and then I get to the third draft, and I'm like, oh, you you didn't fix a fucking... <laughs> it's, it's like, you needed to take a sledgehammer and a welding torch to that original script, and they brought some scissors and tape. Yeah. The difference between those two drafts is I think John Carpenter wrote notes in the margin and they incorporated them. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even about changing anything story-wise. It was just about tidy this up here, make this transition a little cleaner here. This dialogue is a little choppy. Maybe add another line here and there. It's little tweaks and pinches like that. Nothing significant in terms of overhauling anything. Mm. That sounds about right, because it feels like it really needed a lot more love to get this anywhere near production level. And honestly, I don't think John cared. I don't think John had his heart in doing another Michael Myers movie. I think he was just kind of like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like there's any energy to this story at all. And by the way, Dennis Hedgeson, I did actually pick up a copy of Dark Country. I'm about a third of the way through it. I've read, I think, seven or eight of the short stories so far. He's a very hit and miss writer. Hmm. I think his strength is in the actual prose itself. He's great at vivid descriptions, like coming up with just like a really sharp way of describing something or slipping characterization into the way he describes things. But the actual stories themselves are just bland, typical, quick little horror nuggets. There's not really any depth to the characters. A lot of it is like a couple on a cross-country trip stop at a rest stop one night and the husband doesn't realize his wife is dead in the backseat when they leave. Mm. Or a couple of guys are looking into the murder of their friends, so they go talk to the mousy girl at school, and she ends up eating them because her and her family are the survivors of the Donner Party. Oh, how clever. Yeah, it's just kind of like, okay? Yeah. There's stories that when you actually pull back and look at them, they're just not... Re I mean, there, there's a couple ones. Like, there's one where it's a story about this pitch man for kitchen implements. We get to actually see him do this whole, like, routine about, you know, standing before a crowd of elderly ladies showing all these new kitchen gadgets, all these ways you can whirl and twirl and slice and dice and hack and all that stuff. And then the big twist at the end is that on a whole bunch of the units that he sold, he had gone through and removed, like, loosen a screw here, remove a bearing there, something that'll make it so the safety catches on those kitchen implements will cause them to slice back into the owners. Hmm. That's an interesting little twisted story. Yeah, I was going to say, like, that's a little different. Yeah. Better than my family or Donner Party survivors. I can't say that I'm really that deeply impressed. I'll keep going. I might finish the anthology. I might not. I just, even the novelizations he did, I've always found The Fog to be a struggling bore to read. I didn't enjoy his adaptation at all. Halloween 2 was okay, even though it had its lulls. Halloween 3, I was never able to read. When we did that episode, one of our guests actually read it because I just couldn't make it through. I think he's a good wordsmith. I don't think he's a very good storyteller. Yeah, and there's moments in the script that the descriptions do really grab me. I think some of them are practically unfilmable the way they're described, but yeah. I think that they're at least interesting ideas to grab you. There's a vivid eye. Yeah. I absolutely give him that. And again, his success mostly lies in these short little nugget stories. And building a plot like this, I think it's showing that he can't. Or I don't know. I mean, he still writes. He does occasionally put out novels. I've never read any of them. I'm not really that interested in it. Mm -hmm. Listeners, if you've ever read any Dennis Hutchison, let us know. What are the standouts to you? What do you think of his writing? Is there anything specific that you think is worth checking out? Let's dive into Halloween 4 and let me do the first chunk of the synopsis. All right. Actually, I just realized before I even get into the synopsis, there was one thing that struck me as odd. So we open with a scene playing out over the main titles. Then we repeat the tracking shot from the original film, though we're in the modern day Myers house where it's all dusty and grimy and all that stuff. And we see a figure put on the mask in the mirror. And then suddenly we flash back to 1978. It's like, pick an opening. Yeah. Either the titles play out over one of those two scenes. You don't need a title sequence and then the tracking shot and then a flashback, which turns out to be a dream sequence. Spoilers. Right from the start, I'm confused by the choices in this. Yeah, that threw me off too. I don't know what was going on. So the flashback to 1978 picks up right after the original film ends with the Wallace parents returning home to find the house where they left little Lindsay surrounded by cops. 
As she enters her home to find her daughter, it becomes a dream sequence where the house is made of bleeding, pulsating flesh. She finds Lindsay, but the girl is holding a knife and splits open, revealing the form of Michael, who chases Mrs. Wallace and leads us outside where the entire street has become a nightmare landscape. As Mrs. Wallace awakens, she introduces us to the Haddonfield of ten years later, where Halloween is banned and Mrs. Wallace is one of the key protesters demanding scary movies be taken off the air and masks be barred from local stores. Teenage Lindsay is trying to focus on the homecoming committee, but this is a time of year which always leaves her feeling despondent and drawn to Tommy Doyle, who still is across the street. For his part, Tommy, who's dug into an obsession with fear and horror, has something important he wants to tell Lindsay, but he's blocked at every turn by her disapproving mother. Despite her place on the committee, Lindsay is struggling to make friends at school, which isn't helped by her mother's micromanaging and reputation for stamping out Halloween. We meet a whole bushel of teenagers, Leah, Sean, Jennifer, Darcy, Brooke, Corey, and I can't tell any of them apart. <laughs> and also at the school, there's Mrs. Oldenfield, the drama teacher who keeps a loving eye on her students, and Mr. Crab, the English teacher who wants to fuck Lindsay. <sighs> In the town, the current Sheriff Hamilton is dealing with more anti-Halloween parents who want the local drive-in shut down for having the gall to want to play horror movies that night, and there's been a robbery at a local store that he assigns to Detective Hunt, a trigger-happy jock who is a deputy in Halloween 2. Also dealing with anti-Halloween protests is the local TV affiliate, which is trying to dodge around the network running a horror movie marathon that night. Reporter Robert Mundy is tasked with finding something related to the old murders to fill the evening slot. Throughout all of this, people are beginning to catch glimpses of the shape around town. At the end of streets or corridors, around distant corners, just fleeting glimpses but enough to unnerve them. And when a teenager throws a rock through a window of the Myers home and runs away, someone's in there who reaches down and picks up the rock. Meeting Lindsay at school in the science lab, Tommy shows her an experiment that's being run on rats in cages who are periodically electrocuted to keep them in a constant state of fear. He says, It's designed to control you by fear, to make you sick, then numb so you don't feel anything. It could work on a whole town. It keeps you in your place and makes you give up. Then, he gestures across his throat. To continue the quote, It's our parents who are afraid. They want to keep us that way too. So we won't grow up to be like Michael Myers. We only have ourselves. I'm not going to let them make us crazy anymore. That's because there's no boogeyman now to make you behave. He's dead. That's the secret. End of Act 1. At least as best as I could tell, that seemed like a good place to cut off. Yeah, yeah. So. Oh boy. Yeah. So what do you think about the decision to bring back Tommy and Lindsay? I think that's a solid choice, to be honest. Like, I think if you can't get Jamie, by this point, it would have been 10 years since the original. These kids are going to be high school age, perfect for a slasher film. It makes sense. Yeah, I think that's fine bringing in the next generation if you're going to cherry pick the original. Like, and, and, you know, there's other characters from past movies that pop up. We'll have a few more pop up later. Like, I was surprised to see Hunt was actually the cop character who was running around with Loomis in part two. Yeah, I completely forgot about that. Because I kept forgetting the sheriff basically sat out most of it. He had the one scene where he finds his daughter dead, and that's the last time Charles Cyphers ever appears in a Halloween movie. I should point out, the first big major cut was Sheriff Hamilton in this was still Sheriff Brackett in the second draft. Okay. So it was still the old sheriff in town. Again, I don't know if there's a story behind John and Charles Cyphers having a falling out, but after Halloween 2, even though they did like eight movies together before that, they never worked together again. So I don't know what the story is there. Hmm. But yeah, I think it's perfectly fine doing Lindsay and Tommy. There's nothing wrong with that. I think Tommy could use a little more of a Paul Rudding. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I kept picturing Paul Rudd in this role because there's a weird intensity to him. Just like 40-year-old Paul Rudd acting like a creepy teenager. Uh, I was thinking more like <laughs> a teenage Paul Rudd, but you know, you yeah. do you. There's a creepy intensity that fits with the portrayal that he did in Halloween 6, not the later reshoots that they picked up where he basically becomes heroic lead guy and loses all of his weirdness. Which I thought made for a better movie, but he was still less interesting. Yeah. But yeah, this is weirdly intense Tommy. I think that's appropriate. This is a kid who saw yeah. basically evil incarnate. And even if he wasn't hurt by him, he was still touched by that. Yeah. And that's why I kind of like is that his obsession with horror is not really like, this is cool. This is awesome. This is my outlet. It's he was traumatized. And his obsession with horror is trying to understand fear, you know, and understand these mechanics of fear and how social fear. And that now he's looking on a broader scale of like social fear and all that stuff. And then interesting interesting theme to touch on. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of the stuff that he really brings up with the rat cages is ever effectively built on later in the script. Right. It's like a really strong statement of theme and then they never really follow up that theme very well. No. 
But I do like the idea that Tommy and Lindsay, they still live across the street, but it's like, even though they live so close, their parents keep them apart. You know, they're not allowed to talk and hang out, even though they do legitimately bring each other comfort in having gotten through that past trauma together. And that's an interesting setup. Yeah. The characters in this script, unfortunately, are so thin that it would it would all depend on casting. If you could have gotten good actors for both Lindsay and Tommy, I think that would have helped. But the part themselves are not really explored to any significant depth. No. Like, Lindsay, her whole deal is that she doesn't remember the events of the first film. She's repressed it, yeah. That doesn't really ever pay off, does it? Mm-mm. I guess it's a way to create a bit of a bridge between her and Tommy that he has to cross in order to get her mm-hmm. to trust him because she doesn't really remember the events, but he does. So they don't have that connection. No. Yeah. But other than that, there's no real purpose for that. And she's still a bit of an outcast, still a bit weird on her own terms, but not for the same reasons. I don't know. It just doesn't really feel like it had a point to it. Again, it seems like there's interesting stuff here for a setup. But even then, as we get through the rest of the script, there's so much focus on everything going on in the town that they're not really like the lead prominent focus of the story. They just kind of pop in and out alongside everyone else who pops in and out of the story. And yet they're the characters I ended up caring the most about just mainly because of the connection to that first film. Yeah, and even the film ultimately ends with them. They're just not developed. Right. So what did you think about Haddonfield banning Halloween and Mrs. Wallace being one of the chief protesters of the Parents Against Halloween movement? Again, if it had been fleshed out a little bit more, or if it had paid off more towards the end of the film... And especially like this is late 80s, Jason and Freddie and all this, they were in the zeitgeist. It was probably at their peak as far as like cultural awareness and impact. And so like having this discussion about how horror affects our daily lives, how people react to it, it makes sense to explore that Mm -hmm. in a film like this. The problem is, again, it doesn't explore it. It's just saying something about it without actually saying anything about it. Now, this comes to my biggest problem with the script is I love the setup of this divide between the parents and the children. The children who need Halloween as an outlet for the fear that's been building up and the parents trying to drive away Halloween so it won't continue scaring people, but in so doing, driving up the fear. It's like you could have built this really sprawling, almost satirical town turning in on itself hysteria. You don't even need Michael Myers to have an entire town so worked up over Michael Myers that they literally just start turning on themselves because of this escalating conflict and hysteria. I honestly thought for a moment that's where it was going to go. And that actually really intrigued me. That's what I thought this was. Yeah. Because you see so very little of the shape or Michael Myers or whatever you want to call him in the first mm-hmm. two thirds of the script that I yeah. really honestly thought either A, if he does show up, it's going to be somebody else who's going to take on the mask because they were driven insane by these parents who were so controlling and they just snapped. Yeah. Or it was going to be like what you said, where there wasn't a real Michael Myers. It was just this shadow of his events corrupting this town by basically driving them insane and attacking each other, like you said. Yeah, and you could very easily turn it. I mean, because a large part of the script is like costumes are being stolen and teenagers are plotting and making all these cryptic plans and having these conversations about when we're going to meet up, when we're going to launch this and all stuff. And again, it never really builds to anything, but it's like, imagine that film where where it's like the parents want to use the image of Michael to get the kids back in line and the kids want to use the image of Michael to break free from their parents. I mean, you could build a climax where the entire town is dressed up as Michael Myers and are just going at each other in this blind melee, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, you could do it with a satirical edge to it. I mean, you could make a very Heathers movie with that premise of just, it's wacky, it's kooky, but it's also deeply dark and scary, you know? Yeah, yeah. When I first heard about this script and I heard about the setup, I'm like, that's what I thought this script was going to be. And that's actually the type of film I could see Joe Dante make. I could see Joe Dante doing a town descending into chaos with a winking sense of humor to it. Mm -hmm. He's good at building this world of characters and then having them all just escalate into intensity. Yeah, I could see that. I couldn't see Joe Dante directing this film. It's not that I could see him directing this script badly. I just don't see this script interesting Joe Dante. No. Joe Dante has better storytelling sensibilities than to sign on to this. Yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. And honestly, I think that's the biggest issue I have with this script is that wasted potential. of They have a setup. They have themes. They have ideas. But where they actually go with the story doesn't actually build and develop on those ideas. 
Nope. It's a shame because basically I think that's going to be what we keep saying throughout this entire podcast is that there's yeah. so much potential. There's some really good ideas and it just doesn't ever deliver. As I said, how did this make it three drafts in this current state? Don't know. I don't know. So then at the high school, Leah, Jennifer, Darcy, Brooke, and Corey, who's who, JD? Uh, Darcy <laughs> is the first one killed. I remember that much. Yeah. The rest of them, I, I have no clue. Darcy and Leah, I know, get a few like solo scenes later on. I know Jennifer is the one that hooks up with Sean later, though I think Sean was cheating on Leah. And then I think Brooke and Corey hook up with that whole Keith Lonnie group that we're going to get to later on. It's literally just token teenagers. Oh, yeah. There's nothing. It's body count teenagers. That's all they are. They're not even like going with the stereotypes of like the jock, the nerd or anything like that. They're just interchangeable. Teenager one, teenager two, teenager three. There's no story. There's no relationships. Really, the only ones who get developed is Lindsay because she is being bullied at school. Even though she's trying to connect and make friends, she's trying to put herself out there to make friends with people. She's on the homecoming dance committee. Tommy has been fully ostracized, and by her association with Tommy, she's often being ostracized, and her having survived that massacre years ago is something that she still gets mocked about. And also the fact that her mom is constantly trying to tear apart Halloween and making a public spectacle of herself is not helping. Right. So I think the teenagers take out their frustrations with Lindsay's mother on Lindsay. Yeah, I could see that actually happening. Yeah, that's not a bad characterization. No. I think we'll wait to discuss Detective Hunt because we basically, in in these first three pages, we just get an introduction to him where the dude loves his magnum. Yeah. But I think we'll get more into his character as we get deeper into the story. So I think we'll save him. Sheriff Hamilton, just pretty typical town sheriff. As I said, he was originally Sheriff Brackett, who was still himself reeling from the trauma of that night. But I think by changing it, you don't really get any of that. Right. Mundy is, again, a character we'll probably talk about more here in the next chunk because we only really get his establishment here. He's the local news reporter. I do love one of my favorite descriptions in the script is of Mundy. Handsome from a distance. (laughs) I could see that like he's the aging news anchor type who probably used to be a bit bigger. He's the Chris Hardwick. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Let's not talk about Chris Hardwick. Yeah, I know. (laughs) But I mean, yeah, he's got that typical kind of anchorman thing where he's not going to be an actor, but this is the best leading man job he can get. Yeah. Yeah, there's not really much else to add about that setup because we basically just get these little nuggets of threads. What did you think about the whole sequence of the nightmare house in the opening with Mrs. Wallace going through the Myers house made of flesh? I was confused because I was like, is this a secret Freddy versus Michael film that we never were told about? Oh, a lot of the Michael Myers stuff that pops up in this script is very attempting to be Dream Warriors. (laughs) It feels so much like that. I mean, it was okay. Is a fake out opening. It feels cheap. Like, oh, we need to remind people that this is a Halloween film because we won't see Michael Myers till like almost the two thirds mark of the film. Mm -hmm. I like dream imagery in the right film. The Halloween films do not feel like a good fit for that type of story. It's a nice set piece. Why is it here? Right. For the most part, it's very slow build. And I think that's why they needed that initial shock. They would have blown their budget on that sequence. I was going to say, like in 1987, <laughs> they could not have filmed that without like a shit ton of money. Well, I don't think there's anything in this film that you couldn't have done with the same budget of, say, Elm Street 2. Yeah. Because Elm Street 2 had some pretty ambitious visuals that it still pulled off on a limited budget. Yeah. But again, you need a good filmmaker who can do that. Again, Dante is a filmmaker who could pull off some really nice stuff on a low budget. And then you got Carpenter, who at least would have probably been there as a producer and could have advised using what he knows from like the thing and stuff like that. Well, and again, the film he did coming right out of this was Prince of Darkness, which again was a $4 million budget movie. It was super low budget. It Mm -hmm. was one of the lowest budgets he had done since the original Halloween. And yet he still pulled off a lot of really iconic and striking imagery in it. Yeah. Would you have seen John actually directing this script? Oh, no. I don't even see Tommy Lee Wallace directing this script. Tommy Lee Wallace would probably sign on to the project and then rewrite the script himself and then direct that rewrite <laughs> like he did with Halloween 3. But after Halloween 3 bombed, Universal and the Akkads were not going to sign off on Tommy Lee Wallace doing another Halloween. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those ones where it's like, I don't see how you could even shop this script around to get a director. And even the producers were just like, no. And again, how did this make it three drafts? 
Three drafts. Yeah, it's so sloppy. If this was a rough, let's just spit our ideas down on paper. Yeah. It would have been fine. This is just, okay, we're just going to get all the ideas out and then we'll sift through it and take out the good stuff and make that stronger and throw away all the crap. That would have been fine. This is a confusing script, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And we haven't even gotten to the weird parts yet. Who thought this was a good idea and how did it get as far as it did? So So, that wraps up our episode. (laughs) Part one of three. So let's get to the second chunk of text. Investigating the break-in, Hunt finds the guard dog hanging dead with He Lives written on the wall and learns that the store had a stash of illegal Halloween costumes which have gone missing. It turns out they were swiped by Lonnie, Keith, and Richie, the bullying boys from the first movie who are now additional names on the list of teenagers. They've been stealing costumes and decorations because of big plans they have for Halloween. Throughout this section, we see all of the teenagers of town quietly plotting to meet up at the drive-in, while they also bully Lindsay with a dummy with the name Tommy written on it. Mundy and his cameraman hit their first stop, Smith's Grove Sanitarium, where the inhabitants continue sacrificing small animals to an effigy of Michael Myers, branded Lord of the Dead. Marion, the nurse from the opening of the first film, is now Dr. Marion Stern, one of the top doctors at the asylum. She plays him a tape of young Michael refusing to answer any questions or reacting to any prods. Marion's belief is that Dr. Loomis is the one who was unhinged, branding Michael evil and ultimately pressuring the boy to fill the role of a boogeyman, which led to the breakout and murders all those years ago. Their next stop is the high school. After both Mundy and his cameraman act inappropriately with Darcy and are unable to dig up the whereabouts of Laurie Strode, they get Tommy out of class for an interview. Unfortunately, Tommy clams up and doesn't really have anything to say other than that the boogeyman is dead. Our first kill of the movie is Darcy when she heads out to a pumpkin patch to grab a bunch for herself and her friends. After a disturbing sales pitch and jack-o'-lantern demonstration from the farmer, she wanders into the patch, trips, and becomes entangled as pumpkins are popping open beneath her and she keeps slipping in the pulp, even as more roll down from the surrounding piles. When she finally regains her footing, the shape bursts out of a mound of pumpkins and stabs her. And we still haven't gotten to the really weird shit. Nope. In the high school auditorium, an emergency meeting is being held by the town council and PTA to again discuss the ban on Halloween. The drive-in owner protests against their attempts to shut him down because if he doesn't screen horror movies on their biggest night, it'll kill his business. Mrs. Oldenfield then speaks out about how the parents are not only driving up hysteria among their children, but taking away a necessary outlet that allows their fears some form of release. Needless to say, none of this goes over well. Because Lindsay's mother is occupied by the meeting, her father tells Lindsay it's okay for her to go out with the other teens, even as her attempts to make plans with Tommy keep getting interrupted. Soon after, Tommy discovers that the shapes being seen around town are other teenagers and that the stolen costumes they've all been passing around are the same iconic one. Unfortunately, Tommy is in the wrong place at the wrong time as he and several of the teens are busted by Hunt. Sheriff Hamilton is trying to sort out what's going on, which isn't helped by Hunt being a complete asshat as he starts roughing the boys up for answers. Even as the sheriff tries to intervene, Tommy swipes the magnum from Hunt's belt, blames the adults for always making things worse, then he and the boys make a break for it. A young child almost enters the Myers house in a dare from his friends, but his pet dog blows by instead. After a struggle is heard from within, the dog leaps back out seemingly unharmed. The boy and his dog go home, where the dog suddenly coughs up two severed fingers. Our second kill comes at the stop-and-start market where Sean, who's supposed to be dating Leanne, keeps trying to shoo customers out of the store so he can have sex in the back room with Jennifer. When they finally get into the act, she discovers he's dead and his corpse is being humped against her by the shape, who then stabs her. That's where we're going to break before the climax. That's what she said? No pun intended. (laughs) Uh, We'll stick a pin in... No, okay. No, let's let's not go there. (laughs) Yeah. All right, so... Let's start with this whole idea that stores that have a secret stock of illegal Halloween costumes are all being broken into and those costumes are being stolen by the teenagers who are basically passing around identical costumes of the shape to each other. Again, I like the idea of this is the town where Halloween is verboten, but the practical side of me goes, why don't they just go to another town where they can buy them off the rack? That becomes a plot point because they go out of town to the drive-in later. That's right. I forget. Yeah, the drive-in isn't even in town. Right. They have cars. I can see like Haddonfield might say like, we're not going to have any Halloween stores in our city. Okay, that's fine. But they make a point of they're right next to another town. Why would that town ban that stuff? 
It just doesn't make any logical sense, which is fine. Again, if they had managed to make a point out of why this is all being banned, other than just to create a mood, because again, it doesn't ever pay off. Well, again, that would pay off if this film were about parents and kids both using the image and identity of Michael Myers to try to stand up to each other. Right. And again, it's setting up a movie that we aren't actually building towards. It's a great setup for a movie I would like to have read the script for, but we aren't. Mm -hmm. And it was neat seeing Lonnie, Keith, and Richie as the bullies from the first film. Yeah. But again, it's like once you get past that setup, they're just, again, teenager one, teenager two, teenager three. Exactly. Because it turns out that they're dating a bunch of the girls that we already met. And so it's like everyone just kind of fumbles into group of teenage people. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Where it's like you could have put any name on any of these kids and that wouldn't have changed their characterization at all because there is none. No, that's the big problem I have with all these characters, except for Tommy and Lindsay, is that they are all interchangeable for the most part, at least the teenagers. So, and then also with the robbery with the dead dog, that was one little cut that they made from the second draft. In the second draft, the cops are pretty quick to realize that what killed the dog is the dog actually tried to pursue the kids through the window and then cut itself on the glass and it's just hanging by its chain from the glass. So the dog actually killed itself accidentally. Huh. Which again is an interesting thing where it's like, oh no, he's back. Oh wait, no, actually this happened. Where it's like you can see a situation like that where like a bunch of people are going to take it different ways. But because we cut that reveal, it's just another shock scene. Yeah. The visit to Smith's Grove Sanitarium. What did you think of that sequence? This is like the first time I was really starting to get intrigued because it seemed like, okay, we've gone this long and we haven't seen Michael and we get these others who are worshiping him. And Mm -hmm. again, it goes into this iconography, this idea that Michael, even if he's not present, still has a taint on this town. And Mm -hmm. I just was building up in my head like, oh, this isn't going to be actual Michael Myers. This is going to be either someone or someone's either directly or indirectly continuing on his legacy. Like whether or not there was ever going to be a person in a mask, I wasn't sure at this point. Point, mm-hmm. But I was sure like somebody was going to be continuing on his legacy and either killing other people like he would or putting on a mask and just going full Michael Myers, even if it wasn't actually Michael himself. Yeah, no, I agree to all that. I even do genuinely like how the sequence plays out. I like as the reporters get there. It's like you just can have this cryptic scene of these inmates standing around a hole in the ground, constantly trying to get at something in the bottom of it. They ultimately catch a rabbit. And then later on, the cameraman accidentally wanders into the group room where there's this effigy hanging on the wall of Michael Myers, and they've literally sacrificed that little rabbit to him. Yeah. That's a really nice striking image that, again, if that had been the opening scene of the movie, I think, would have been a nice way to lead us in. Like, that's like our only scene in the asylum, and then we hit the town and see this reaction to the iconography, like, expanding on an even bigger scale. Mm -hmm. And then what did you think about the sequence with Marion? She was Marion Crane in the original. She's probably just gotten married since then, so she's now Marion's turn. She felt like a fill-in for Loomis. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that's what you meant, that you said like actor availability may have played a factor. In- sort of. It, it was still Marion for the majority of it. When she plays the video of Michael, it was supposed to be the voice of Loomis talking to Michael, but it went even further where Loomis is kind of acting like Loomis did in Halloween 5, where it's just all over like, say something, damn it, say something, and like even raising his hand to the kid and mm. fully Loomising out. Yeah. Yeah, going the full down of the pleasant, even. Yeah, and I kind of like the idea of Loomis being as much of a cause of Michael Myers. I don't love that idea, but as far as like something to explore, it could have been an interesting right. route to take to say like, yes, Michael was a troubled boy, but he was made even worse by this old man who was insisting that he was evil incarnate. Like, that would fuck you up. Yeah, I, again, kind of like that idea, but I also kind of like that there's a fallibility to her belief because when they talk about, you know, even when he murdered his sister, she's like, allegedly. But we know from the first movie, yes, he did actually kill his sister. Yeah. So it's like, even she's coming from a very biased perspective on that. And it should be pointed out, continuity-wise, so Halloween's 1 and Halloween's 2 both happened. Michael and Loomis both died at the end of Halloween 2. So the tape of Loomis was when Michael was like a teenager. No returning actors with a slight bit of silicon on their face. A decreasing amount of makeup as the films go along. <laughs> yes, yeah. But the increasing scent of alcohol. <laughs> oh. Hey, you. <laughs> Again, it's an interesting idea. I didn't mind having Marion be the one to express it. It was kind of nice having her back. Right. And then Monday and everyone goes to the high school where, sure, the high schools will dig out records on former students and even call students from their classes for the local press. <laughs> They'll absolutely do that. Uh, the 
days were a hell of a time, man. So what did you think about the way that Laurie Strode still exists? She, it's like they didn't have Laurie Strode die or fake her death. She just left this all behind. We get mentions of her from now and then, but nobody really knows where she is or where she went. I'm kind of okay with it, just in the sense that I never liked the fact that in that middle trilogy, Laurie had died off screen. Mm -hmm. I never liked that. I didn't like it in Alien 3. I just don't like the idea of killing off a character that you were rooting for so much in an offhand manner without us being a part of it. So I kind of like the fact that she was able to get away. And yeah, they're leaving it open for her to come back if they were ever yeah. able to get Jamie Lee Curtis back, which I imagine at that point, they probably didn't have high hopes, but they were probably were keeping it open just as a possibility. Yeah. And I could see Jamie coming back like 20 years down the road in the way that she did in the recent film, mm -hmm. building off of this, where it's not that she like fled with any like espionage. It's just she's like, I'm fucking done with this and just left. Yeah. She went out and lived her life somewhere. So then the whole interview with Tommy. It, <laughs> no. I, no. I didn't like it. No. I wasn't there. Yeah. That's not what happened. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was there to make Tommy seem weird. Yeah. More than anything. And I kind of wondered, like, are they going to make Tommy or Michael stand in? Like, maybe he has, like, a split personality or something like that where he's just so intense and so, like, weird. And even though he's kind of our, by default, main character... They don't do a good job of making him no. likable. I kind of get it if he had a point to being so standoffish, but it didn't seem to serve any of the plot, which is what I could say about most of the script. I kind of like it from the angle of Mundy is trying to find salacious details, even though he knows it's bullshit, and Tommy's not having any of it. Yeah. It's not a scene that really goes anywhere. Okay, so even if we're building this entirely different plot of all these teenagers are organizing this thing, you know, even building off of this script, what's kind of nice is because Tommy and Lindsay are the ones ostracized from the main group, they aren't part of any of that planning, this secret plot of the teenagers that's going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. They're just the people who are now falling into it. They're the people who are our eyes to the hysteria around them that they're getting caught up in, even though they're not a part of it. Again, that's an interesting idea, not interesting in execution. Yeah. And then the whole scene with Darcy where Mundy's like gently autographing her arm and then the cameraman's watching her ass as she's walking away. <sighs> yeah. High school. Yeah, we didn't discuss the teacher who also was really creepy. Dr. Crab, who has like two scenes where he just really awkwardly and obviously hits on Lindsay and then like we never see him again. Yeah, and he doesn't serve a point, but that and the cameraman both being creepy, lecherous old men. I think it was par for the course for 80s slasher movies. Yeah. Sadly. And I kind of get that, but it doesn't serve the plot. It just seemed there to sexualize our main character just for that right. reason, just for sexuality's sake. And it's not playing up the cameraman or Mr. Crab in any way that leads to their payoffs. No. Because neither of them has a payoff. Mr. Crab just disappears from the story and the cameraman is at the climax, but nothing happens to him. Right. It's moments that don't have any purpose behind them. That's the big thing. And then let's talk about the death of Darcy in the pumpkin patch. What do you think about that sequence? I kind of love it in the fact that it is a great cartoon sequence that <laughs> somehow somebody was trying to make into a live action film. <laughs> it is basically... It's like two pages of her slipping on pumpkins. <laughs> yes, exactly. It is something that if she was Wile E. Coyote, it'd be one thing. But as a human being getting bowled over by a pumpkin and then slipping on pumpkin guts and then getting bowled over by more pumpkins and then just out jumps Michael Myers from a giant pile of pumpkins... How does any of that work? No. It's ridiculous. It's kind of hilarious where all of a sudden I go, oh, this isn't going to be a clever film about like social commentary about like the nature of All you had to of, say like, was this isn't going to be a clever film. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> then it just becomes just a cartoon. It is. So I keep coming back to I, I just picture this as a cartoon. Yeah. That image of Michael Myers bursting out of a pile of pumpkins. I could see that like being a great visual if you just freeze frame it. If you did it in the right way. Yeah. But as far as like trying to actually make it like, hey, how does he get underneath a pile of pumpkins? Does the pumpkin solicitor guy, like, did he bury him in it? Yeah. I found a recent interview where Dennis Etchison was talking about the script, and he is so proud of the pumpkin. He's like, I built this amazing set piece in a pumpkin patch. 
I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you made a great bit of comedy in a pumpkin patch. It's an amusing sequence that's, again, in the wrong film. Yes. It has nothing to do with the story that you were setting up. When I got to this sequence, this is when I realized, oh, no, this script is not going to go where I thought it was going to go. Yeah, that's pretty much where I thought. Not only is it building an entire set piece around something that has nothing to do with the story that they've been developing, but then, oh, shit, they're resurrecting Michael Myers. This is when I literally realized, oh, they are resurrecting Michael Myers. This is undead Michael Myers literally bursting from the grave of pumpkin patches, you know? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it's not Michael Myers, it's the shape. So I think it's more the boogeyman is coming back. It's not that Michael Myers is back, the boogeyman is back. The actual supernatural force in the shape of the shape is returning. Yeah. That's when this script lost me. Yeah. Say what you will about 4, 5, and 6. They had a lot of weird ideas, like... Cult of the Thorn. <laughs> yeah. But at least that is an explanation for what's happening, and we never really get an explanation as to what's happening in this, which is fine. Like, the first film doesn't explain why Michael's doing what he's doing. He's just a guy with a knife who's killing people, and that's fine. Well, when you get into the more overtly supernatural stuff, like why you need to have a little bit more explained here. And they don't. It's just he's the boogeyman. Oh, it makes sense to me. Well, the thing is that this amount of fear has been built into the town while its ability to release that fear has been taken away. So that fear is literally penting itself up to the point where it's literally summoning the supernatural force of the boogeyman. I don't know how they're tying that into the original Michael Myers, but I think it's more just Michael Myers is the symbolic representation of that fear, and they are literally giving life to the fear by not allowing their kids to release it. Yeah, and that's an explanation. I find that a frustrating one. I just don't find an interesting story. Yeah, and again, it's in the wrong film. Like, that is a Freddy-type thing. Yeah. It doesn't fit Michael, or the shape, or anything else that we had seen in the two previous films. No, yeah, and it's they're trying to compete in the horror market. And yeah, slashers ruled for a while, but then, you know, 1984 was when you got Elm Street. It was 85 or 86 was when you got Hellraiser. Suddenly you had to be more outlandish. You can see that here where it's like, yes, Michael is back, but you know, we have the dream house. We have this sequence. You know, Even as Michael comes up, he has other powers and stuff that I'm sure we're going to talk about where he's very obviously not human anymore. And again, I need to stop calling him Michael because it's not Michael. It is literally fear embodied as the shape. Yeah. You know, again, I could see you doing interesting things with that. I remember the Disney movie, Mr. Boogity. <laughs> this is not Mr. Boogity, Mr. Etchison. <laughs> if you're going to bring back Michael Myers as a supernatural force, then you're losing Michael Myers. They already did that with Jason. I think you can level your pros versus cons as to whether or not making Jason supernatural was a good idea or not. Either way, they committed to it and did things with it. Yeah. I think if you're having Michael follow the same suit, then you're just having Michael follow the same suit. Yeah, Michael may have came out before Jason, but if you're doing this, then you're just ripping off Jason and you're ripping off Freddy. And it's cheap. It's cheap and it's shoddy workmanship and it's just shoddy storytelling. Yeah. There's a lot of nods to other horror films in this. A lot of them are nods to Carpenter's work. Like there's a Halloween 3 reference in the film. No more days till Halloween. Yeah, one kid yeah. actually says that. Yeah, and I feel like this is Etchison trying to like do every single horror film, put it in a blender, and this is what he got out of it. It feels like a treatise on the current state of the horror cinema, and it's one I would have given a D- minus to. Yeah, he recognizes all the tropes and the current trends. He's touching on stuff, but he doesn't know how to dig into any of it. Yeah, there's nothing to say about any of it. I was so intrigued by the premise of, you know, this whole secret plot to Halloween and the parents versus the kids and all that stuff that the moment the shape appeared and in that sequence, because of the ridiculousness of it, I realized we are going supernatural. Mm -hmm. That was the moment I realized it is going to be a supernatural presence. And I just basically was like, fuck it. Yeah. You literally lost what you had. You had an interesting setup, but I could already see that they were not going to go the right direction with it. Mm-hmm. Then we get, you know, like the whole town meeting. We have all other various scenes of teenagers interacting. Were there anything like in all those character bits that leapt out to you? 
I kind of like the discussion of the drive-in owner mm -hmm. basically saying like, hey, look, we used to watch scary movies as kids too. And the parents were like, yeah, but those were better. Yeah. He's like, it's just changed. It's not really any different than what we used to do. And I thought like, okay, that's a kind of almost statement on something. It seems to be a statement built up against straw men, but you know, it's addressing a point. But the rest of it, it just felt like, okay, this is where it should be leading to something a little bit more. Like, it should be paying off some of the stuff that they've been building up to by this point. And you even then when Mrs. Oldenfield comes up and is like, you know, you've been building up this tension in your children while not letting them get any of it out. Yeah. At some point, that's going to come out. Do you want it to be in a bad way or a way that you have some control over? Again, thematically interesting, not where they go. Yeah. Unless you argue that, you know, the shape is where everything leads and it's like, fuck that. Yeah. Like all the scenes of the teenagers interacting, like there's the whole bullying of Lindsay with the dummy. Whole bunch of teenagers like, we're going to meet up the drive-in. Yeah, let's go to the drive-in. Hey, you come to the drive-in. Let's go to the drive-in. It's just a lot of that. Leanne being like, where's Sean? I'm supposed to meet with Sean. Sean's with Jennifer. I don't care. Yeah. You're telling me this stuff. And I'm like, I know I read it. Yeah. I don't remember half of it. But that's all because I wrote the synopsis today while reading the script again today. So yeah. <laughs> and then I kind of like the moment where Lindsay's dad finally gives her his blessing to just, you know, go out, have fun. Don't worry about your mom. She's not here. I'll cover for you. That's a nice moment. Yeah. But it's coming in this scene where Lindsay and Tommy are trying to set plans to meet up and they both keep getting interrupted so they don't hear what each other is saying. It's so badly written. Yeah. It's a clever idea. Like, she thinks he's asking her to the dance and he is just trying to get her to run away with him, essentially. When people have a conversation they like that, they say, hang on, I didn't catch that. Can you say it again? Yeah. It's a very bad note to build a scene on. Yeah. And then there's the whole scene where Tommy sees the shape. And I kind of like that his first instinct is to just directly go up and confront it. Like he sees this shape and it's not like I'm going to run. I'm not going to warn people. It's like, oh, I need to see what this is about. Mm -hmm. He knows Michael Myers is dead. So what is the story behind? What I need to know who's fucking around here and he goes up and he finds that there's the teenagers that are passing around the costume to shape and then they get busted by the cops there's all the hunt doing his interrogations tommy grabbing the gun and doing the breakout what did you think about that whole sequence i didn't care for it to be honest again it paints tommy to be so intense and so out there like he doesn't feel believable mm -hmm. the paul rudd version he was weird and intense but he was this is a guy who cracked a little bit because of the things that he's seen i just want to make sure you're safe are you safe yeah are you safe yeah, he's definitely weird and creepy, but at least he's... Part of that was Paul Rudd was having fun with characterization. <laughs> yeah, I think the shows like Paul Rudd later became a comedian. But this version, he's just so intense. And I mean, like, he's that age where he's full of hormones and like he wants to just leave this town and it's dust. When I like the whole theme of he's the one who knows what's going on and is blaming the parents for it. And it's like, why wouldn't you just stop and listen to yourselves and see how much you're hurting all of us by the way you're treating us? Yeah, but then he goes and grabs a gun and it's just weird. What did you think about the whole like uber macho way they've been playing up Hunt? I didn't care for it. It just seemed like he's going to be the asshole who's going to do something stupid to get killed later on or get somebody else killed for it. And he's literally like breaking kids' arms in the interrogation room while the sheriff is like, what the fuck are you doing? Right. And that's where the scene was again so poorly constructed that I can see, yeah, Tommy being so shocked by Hunt doing this that he would go for the gun to get Hunt to let the kid go. But they already had Hamilton enter the room and Hamilton was already intervening and yeah. getting Hunt off of the kid, thus removing any justification that Tommy had for going for his gun. Yeah, that's why it felt weird to me. If Hamilton had not been in the room at the time and Tommy had gotten the gun to force Hunt to let the kid go at gunpoint, and then Hamilton came in, I could see that Hamilton would actually be willing to give Tommy a listen on what happened in the situation. Yeah. Because he's already constantly been on Hunt for being a loose cannon. It's just a poorly written scene. And again, it's exactly the same as it was in draft two. Yeah, I don't know. This, ugh, this film. So then what did you think about the whole scene at the Myers house with the little kids and the dog and the dog ends up coughing up two fingers? I didn't mind it that much compared to all the other stuff. It's weird. And I would think that the shape could take out a dog. It's a weird scene. Yeah. And plus, it really doesn't seem to pay off other than the fact to right. show again later on that this is a supernatural version right. of Michael or the shape. 
because they're not even using it to differentiate him between the other people who dress up as the shape. Right. Because by the time we get to that sequence, his fingers have literally physically grown back. Right. Like we even see a moment where they literally regenerate. Like Wolverine. I don't even know why it's here. And like I said, I think it was just to make it more clear, like Michael is completely supernatural now, which is... But why? Yeah, but I don't why? understand why it's in this series. And then what did you think about the stop and start market? I didn't like it. This feels like a Jason move. Like yeah. the whole, okay, two teenagers going out to have sex. Even before we get to their deaths, we have the whole buildup of him trying to clear customers out of the shop. And you got the homeless man who just wants to huff his pine saw. Mm -hmm. You get the homeless lady who just wants her trash bags. You get the little kid who I can't even remember what the little kid wanted. You have the guy who wants his vodka mixer but can't get vodka. It's like, I need to get this customer out of the shop so I can have sex. And as he goes back to have sex, another customer's in the shop. I need to get them out so I could. It's just this whole string of four. It's like, oh my freaking God. Yeah. And then it's really nasty stuff like, oh, hey, homeless guy wants to huff pine saw. Yeah. Hey, I want my pine saw. In the 80s, people just made fun oh, yeah. of homeless people. Taste didn't really exist in the 80s. Yeah. This was supposed to be like a quirky scene, I think. And it wasn't really funny. Then we get into the whole killing part. That just felt gross. And like I said, it felt like something Jason might do, not something Michael would do. Yeah. And then and then the big final scene where Sean and Jennifer finally have sex and then she realizes we don't even have a moment where he gets killed. It's like, as he keeps thrusting, we discover that the hands of the shape are on his head and neck. How is that keeping him, like, his entire body, like, thrusting in and out of her? Yeah. And then it's like she notices screams and he slashes her. They've done this gag before. Like, we've had the couple having sex who get stabbed through. We've had that in Friday the 13th. Even Bay of Blood, the old late 60s Giallo movie that a lot of the Friday the 13th kills were taken from, that did that gag where it's like they're so caught in the throes of sex that even when they've been stabbed through with a harpoon, the two are still in the throes of sex until they die. Yeah. It's not so much I mind the taste. It was just even the construction of it. Just It's like I can't even visualize how no. that would... Be executed in a way that would be interesting to direct. Right. I'm just picturing Michael essentially using a human Barbie doll where they're just slamming the bodies together. Yeah. So she finally opens her eyes. But by grabbing just the head and neck? Yeah, it doesn't seem like that would work. For a guy who's known for his descriptive text, that's a really damned vague descriptive text. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make any sense. No. It's one of those things that's there to shock you. And when you actually analyze it with any type of analysis. Oh, it's not even an analysis it's just upon initial reading it's like yeah no, upon reaction <laughs> yeah it doesn't make any sense so moving into the third act as the homecoming dance which we never see comes to a close the kids all gather in their cars and limos and head for the drive-in where they screen a mess of popular horror films which would have been impossible to license the rights of all <laughs> there's the usual web of who hooks up with who who stood up who has to get snacks for everybody who still needs rides as the crowd gradually quiets in for the night, it's revealed people are being killed one by one in their cars, their bodies silently watching the film as a fog begins drifting between the vehicles. Leah is the first to notice, though she's quickly yanked into a vehicle. Then Lonnie seems to be the last one around, wandering before he calls to a person who turns out to be the shape, who then chases him, during which we notice his severed fingers regrow, as we mentioned. Lonnie's death leads to Lindsay, who thought the shadows in the mist might be Tommy. During all of this, the town is in a panic. Hamilton has gone from chasing after Tommy to learning of the dead teenagers that have begun to appear, as parents have gone from angry protesters to fearing for children they haven't heard from in hours. All they can think is that Michael is back. Even at the news station, as Mundy is beginning to catch up and realizes he encountered one of the now-slain teens, Tommy bursts in and tells him that the boogeyman is alive. As cops and Tommy and press and parents and even Dr. Marion Stern all converge on the drive-in, so do the last batch of teenagers who all pour in dressed as The Shape. As cops armed with shotguns take position, we find Lindsay surrounded by dozens of shapes unable to tell which is the right one. Dr. Stern moves in, trying to appeal to Michael's senses. He reveals himself and knocks her away, but with him separated from the group and Lindsay running for safety, Tommy hoists up his stolen magnum and is the first to open fire, leading the other cops to rain down a hail of bullets and buckshot. And then things get weird, but we'll save that for the very end. And they do get weird. Here's my big question. 
why is the climax built around the drive-in instead of the homecoming dance? See, I don't think you need the homecoming dance necessarily. I mean, admittedly, it would be a nice thematic return since it's essentially the return of Michael Myers. But this is the site of horror films being played, and then it becomes the site of an actual horror film. It's not clever, but it's something that's approaching clever in a weird way. I can kind of see it. But again, there's no payoff. And the big frustrating thing for me about this whole third act, all the kids are mostly killed off screen. Exactly. It's all been building to, and by the way, everyone's already dead. You didn't get to see any of them die. Right. That is so frustrating. That is like, if you're going to have Michael be this silent killer, that's fine. But you guys show us more than just the two people that we see him grab. Like everything else is just, oh, he walks into a car. Hey, these people are dead. Oh, no. What about, oh, no, these people are dead, too. Like you're in the aftermath by that point. You're not actually seeing like what people are there to see, which is the horror film. There is some vaguely clever, like you see Jason on screen and Michael superimposed against him. Yeah. The reason why I bring up the homecoming dance is because if you have this whole plot building, this whole conspiracy of teenagers stealing and spreading around these Halloween costumes and decor, planning to basically revolt against their parents, they're going to hijack the homecoming dance and turn it into a Halloween party. Yeah. And it ends up blowing up in a very bad way. That is a climactic set piece that would allow you to play out the themes and story threads that you've actually been setting up. Whereas with the drive-in, ultimately all of the plans and conspiracies the teenagers have been was literally, hey, let's go to the drive-in tonight. Yeah. That's it. It was literally just, who's going to give me a ride to the drive-in? Who's bringing popcorn? Who's going to get snacks? Who am I going to hook up with? None of the conspiracy has actually been about Halloween and this whole revolt against the ban and all that stuff. It's all been about, let's go to the drive-in. And again, I understand the imagery of a set piece of a drive-in where everyone in their cars is secretly dead. Mm -hmm. And again, that's Etchison echoing back to one of his early stories where a person pulls into a rest stop not realizing that all the people in the cars around him are dead. But this is not the movie for that set piece because that set piece doesn't allow you to actually culminate any of the threads that you set up. No. Instead, you're just abandoning all these characters that you took time to set up just to reveal, oh, by the way, they're all dead now. Yeah. I hate that. It's very frustrating. It's probably the most frustrating part of this whole script. It all builds to nothing. Yeah. Again, I think the reason he chose the drive-in, he wants to play homage to all of these other horror films, but he doesn't have anything to say about them. No, he doesn't. It's just mentioning a lot of stuff and, again, trying to go through and get the licenses for all that stuff in order to actually play it in the movie wouldn't be worth the effort of even doing it. Yeah. I mean, hey, what if the joke is that the film that they're all watching is Season of the Witch? That would be fine. Yeah. And set up that that was a film within the film. Right. But why do we need to see Reanimator, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Christine playing at the same time at the same drive-in? What does any of this have to do with the release of all this pent-up fear? If the whole argument about the film is that by banning horror and horror movies and costumes and scaring, you're not allowing your kids to have a release. Well, these kids have all just left the town and have gone to a horror movie marathon, which is technically giving them that release. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't pay off anything they're setting up. It thematically is completely nonsensical. This is a shitty script. Yeah. I don't like to get vitriolically hyperbolic, but this is a terrible script. No, I agree. And we still haven't gotten to the weirdest parts yet. (laughs) No. And then, yeah, there's some half-hearted stuff with, like, Leah is the first one who notices that people are getting killed, and then she gets yanked into a car and gets killed, and we find her body later. And then, of all people, Lonnie, one of the hapless trio of indecipherable schlubs, yeah. is the guy who's just kind of wandering around, trying to get snacks, but there's no one there. I think he goes to the bathroom at one point, and doesn't realize that all the cars that he's passing, which are all starting to be surrounded by mist, and you actually have the fog playing on the screen at the time, and he's actually responding to the Adrian Burpo dialogue from the fog, as a fog is actually filling the movie theater. What the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, it's somebody who thinks they're really clever and they really don't have anything to say about anything. So there's no payoff to any of it. It's just like, oh, hey, wouldn't this be neat? Again, that's not a terrible payoff. Like if you take this whole sequence, strip it out on its own, 
it's not bad. You could actually build a really nice film around a drive-in theater playing a horror movie marathon where the kids who are all at the drive-in don't realize that they're all being killed one by one and that all these people sitting in the cars around me are dead. You could build that as its own slasher film. You could make a really nice slasher film out of that concept and out of a lot of the imagery and a lot of the moments that happen in this script. They have jack all to do with what was being set up in the first half of the script. Yeah. And even then, like, the actual execution isn't well done because, yeah. like I said, all the kids are killed off screen. Except for Lonnie, who sees someone moving in the shadows and is like, Hey, down there, how you doing? You okay? What's going on? And, of course, he's yelling at the killer. Right. Which would be fine, I guess. Like, in another horror film, it would... It'd be an just, eye roller. I'm sorry. Yeah, it wouldn't be great, but it was fine. To me, it's just, we should be, as viewers, experiencing at least some of these kills. Like, I mean, I don't expect it to go through... They said there was, like, three screens. So, like, I don't want to see, like, 150 cars worth of kills. But again, if you built an 80-minute movie around this set piece, like, just on its own... Oh, yeah. Yeah, you could actually get some really interesting kills. Yeah, I could see that being using the screams of what's going on on the yeah. screen or people reacting to the horror and then the actual horror yeah. just happening right next to them. That could be really well done. We don't get any of that. No, we don't. There's no payoff. It no. is so frustrating. None. And the whole build to the homecoming dance, which again is a place where you could have actually enacted out a lot of the things that you were setting up, and the entire homecoming dance is off screen as we see everyone leaving it at the end. Yeah. Oh, God, I hate this script. I've read this script four times in the last two weeks. Oh, I pity you. Oh, man, it was hard. And I still can't tell who most of the teenagers are. And then, yeah, as Lonnie's finally getting killed by the shape, during this entire sequence, Lindsay is there, but they never explain where she was during the whole, like, Leah and Lonnie bits. Suddenly it just remembered, oh, by the way, she's still here, as she just kind of walks in and thinks these shadows in the midst are Tommy, even though she's supposedly surrounded by people. Why would she even assume that's Tommy? Yeah, I don't understand. Cutting out to the rest of the town, I kind of like that everything's building to a head where Mrs. Wallace... It's not so much the whole, how dare the kids, it's are they safe? That's what's really all about, is the parents just want to make sure their kids are safe. I like that moment, but then you have this moment where they get to the movie theater and, like, Mr. Wallace is trying to go in and help, and a cop literally puts him in a chokehold, and, like, Mrs. Wallace is, like, beating on the cop's arm, and it's like... <sighs> Yeah. And then Tommy gets out of his whole situation of grabbing a cop's gun and holding him at gunpoint by just going to the press. Yeah. <laughs> and then, again, the whole thing that we've been building towards that you're going to have a whole bunch of teenagers dressed as the shape suddenly just happens. And then, within a page, Michael Myers is singled out from that entire group. And then that entire group literally never gets described again. What happened to all those other teenagers dressed as the shape? I wondered that same thing. Where did they go? Did they blow up? Don't know. This script certainly doesn't tell us anything. Yeah. This third draft script doesn't tell us. <laughs> third draft screenplay even made less sense in the second draft. They just cleaned up some description text. That's literally it. <laughs> But yeah, that's your big image that you've been building towards. These teenagers stealing the costumes of the shape so that you have dozens of the shape running around and all this chaos. And it's literally done in one page. Mm -hmm. It's done and over in one page. And then you never have any consequence of that sequence. Nothing ever happens to those teenagers. They're never seen again. They're not like shot. Nothing. Nothing. They're just not even just, it's like the script forgets they existed. Yeah. Draft three. I'm so angry right now because this is such poor writing. This is such poor writing. Ben Tramer in the second film when he gets killed. Oh, the Ben Tramer sequence is great. It's such a small <laughs> part, but it is something that it does kind of the same thing. Oh, it's Michael. No, wait, it's not Michael. But it has a payoff. It sets the stakes. If you're a nerd for continuity, you'll know that yeah. that's who Jamie had a crush on in the first film. The Ben Tramer arc in Halloween 2 is better than this entire script <laughs> right and it is such a small part but it pays off way better than yeah. any of this this is this thing that they've been building up to the entire time yeah it's astonishing again that this script got as far as it did yeah and just nobody said this doesn't work until they sent it out to the i don't blame at all the people at universal and the akkads for looking at this script and being like what <laughs> no <laughs> no John is himself such a strong screenwriter. How did, again, this is where I think John was just, he was friends with Dennis Etchison and let Dennis Etchison have a loose leash to do whatever right. he wanted. 
And John didn't care. John had zero investment in doing another Halloween movie and needed to do it for a buck. Mm -hmm. And even then, he made his cash in selling off his share of Halloween to the Akkads. And even then, started to resent that years later and tried to buy it back. John didn't give a shit. John didn't care about this script. And it shows. It's quite possible he just knew that this was going to be a payday for his friend and just signed off on it for that reason. He knew that it was probably never going to get made, but at least they'd pay for the script and then something better might come along later. It's the only thing I can think of. So since we're in our final thoughts, let's go ahead. Let's finish this thing off. We do still have the other scenes like Dr. Stern shows up. Yeah. And is able to get Michael to react and separate himself from the crowd just by saying, Michael, do you really want to do this? Come with me. And literally Michael separates himself from the crowd when it's like, no, the shape is going to play with this. You're not going to let this opportunity pass to stir some chaos. Yeah. Again, they completely waste the sequence. And I kind of like that Hamilton is very hesitant to have people open fire and accidentally kill the wrong person. Again, this is where I think Hunt is completely misplayed because Hunt was directly involved in the sequence that killed Ben Tramer. So he should be the one who's very hesitant to open fire on who might be innocent teenagers. Right. And then Tommy jumps on a car roof with the Magnum and he's the one who leads the fire brigade. And it's just, yeah, it's his big damn hero moment. (laughs) Yeah. Again, it's so out of place with what the rest of this film is and not that this film has any type of real substance as to what it actually is. But this just feels like, oh, this is their action scene. Okay. So you ready for the last bit? Oh, let's get into this. As Michael is riddled with bullets, he starts to grow until he's as big as the drive-in screen itself, which he tears apart. Suddenly, the cars all around him explode one after the other, swallowing the figure in fire and blasting police back to the ground. As the smoke clears, there's no body of the shape left behind, just charred playground equipment. Tommy and Lindsay are feared dead, but they actually wandered off looking down at the remains from a hill. They retreat to a barnyard where they have sex until morning. Then Lindsay awakens to find the silhouette of a gigantic shape towering over them. She screams up out of that dream and Tommy does his best to comfort her. What the fuck? (laughs) You know. This is like we don't have an ending. Let's make it as spectacle as we can. Yeah, like Michael regenerating fingers. That felt weird. Giant 12 foot tall Michael and then taller Michael, whatever. It's just like, what the fuck? I just didn't know how to react to this. Ultraman Myers. It vaguely reminds me of Jason X when you get Super Jason. Yeah, Cyber Jason. But taken to like the 10th degree. It Mm -hmm. is so insane. At least that film was like tongue in cheek and built it up and actually had a payoff for it. This is just, he grows really big, starts a fireball because of cars exploding. And it's not even we have Michael doing anything. It's slowly then all the cars blow up and Michael's gone. Yeah, it is so fucking weird. weird. And then, and then, and then... What's left behind is the charred remains of playground equipment? Yeah, I didn't understand. Like, I was like... Is that like Michael's lost childhood innocence? It's his rosebud. I didn't know if it was that or if it was just there's a playground at in this... In the middle of, middle of the, the drive-in. I missed that if there is. It didn't make any sense to me. I think you're probably right. I think it's supposed to be like the only thing that's left is his innocence. What's left of Michael Myers is his child. Is his childhood playground equipment, (laughs) you know, when he swallowed it after he grew up to be 30 feet tall or whatever. I'm even just trying to visualize like mid 80s film. You stuck through all this and then suddenly just thinking about the visual effects of that era on a low budget film of Michael expanding in size before exploding. I do like that you get the detail of like all the cops who are like on the fence around thing are like blown off their feet. Again, where's the teenagers who were dressed as Michael? Were they engulfed in flames? Did they run away? Did they turn into playground equipment? Did they turn into playground equipment? It's like, oh, I finally found my son, Dougie, and they pull off the mask. But he's a slide now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Dougie, we'll keep you polished and slippery for time to come. Oh, yeah. My son is now (laughs) berry-go-round. And then this whole thing of revealing that, like, Tommy and Lindsay, who were standing in the middle of all of this, you know, they're fine. They just crawled over to a hill off to the side, but their parents all think that they're dead. 
And instead of going to tell their parents, hey, we're okay, we're fine, they walk away to a barnyard somewhere, have sex all night, fall asleep, and then she has a nightmare sequence of a gigantic towering Michael, Mm -hmm. and then just wakes up screaming, and then the movie's done. And I just... Yeah. I guess having like the dream sequence fake out, that's typical horror movie stuff. And then like just fading onto a field of pumpkins before it fades to black. Like that's fine. Like I guess as an ending, it's not satisfying in any sense, but at least it's not as what the fuck is the rest of the last act had been. Yeah. And that it was the same thing from draft two to draft three. (laughs) Yeah. They didn't change any. I mean, they cleaned up the writing a bit, but all the beats are the same. It's not satisfying in any sense. Even if we didn't have that weirdness with the giant Michael, it would be limp and unsatisfying. Halloween giant. (laughs) Oh. Yeah, I I just, it's, people know me. People know I have a good tolerance for schlocky stuff. This isn't schlock. This is not cheesy. It's just very poor construction, very bad ideas and choices that are made throughout. It's confusing. It's frustrating because there's interesting ideas here, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't build on any of them. It doesn't go in a satisfying direction with any of them. And I think it's just Dennis Etchison, he got so in love with some of his set pieces that he had come up with, like the pumpkin patch, the nightmare house, the drive-in theater, that instead of like realizing this is not the story for those, he just shoehorned them in and the story just fell apart. I don't even think the story fell apart. The story just never came together to begin with. Right. I'm not only shocked that there's three drafts, but they let Dennis Etchison write all three drafts. I would have given this to Tommy by now. Even if Universal won't let him direct, I would have brought Tommy in for a rewrite. Tommy is a wild writer. He's a very chaotic writer. His scripts are kind of all over the place, but he has a good impulse for ideas in terms of coming up with a lot of really interesting... He's a very outside-the-box writer, and I think he could have taken the ideas of this script and really done something much more interesting with them that then could have been tightened up. But this is just... This is not... I do not blame anyone at the studios for looking at the script and being like, we're not doing this. Yeah. I cannot blame Joe Dante for only ever being in talks to direct this, never actually signing on. God, to be a fly in the room as those people read this script for the first time. I don't know (laughs) what anyone was thinking when it comes to like giving even like the most tacit approval of this. Like, we're going to pay you money for this idea. Even if John didn't really give a shit and just kind of let Dennis Hutchison do whatever he wanted... How did Deborah Hill let the script fly? Because she's got stronger storytelling instincts than this. Yeah. Again, the only thing I can think of is they had a friend who just needed money and they were like, we know we can get you paid. We can get paid. You can get paid. It's a win-win for everyone. The script will never get made. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Just write any shit that you want to. And I mean, like, this is early on. They didn't have the formula necessarily set in stone as to what a Michael Myers film. Well, it's not even formula. This is just basic storytelling. It doesn't work. Exactly. Even taking that in mind, like, okay, yeah, they could have gone in a more supernatural realm with Michael. I don't like that, but that's a choice they could make. Yeah. This is still not executed well enough to justify it. I mean, I have my problems with Halloween 3. I don't think it is a very good film, but it is a very interesting film. Mm -hmm. This is one, even if you get someone to direct it on the same level as Halloween 3, I don't think this would have been an interesting script. Again, interesting setup interesting ideas to its premise, but it doesn't deliver on any of it. I mean, Halloween 3, still, when you get to that final ending where the commercial plays, you're still delivering on the setup. Mm -hmm. For all of its craziness with the Stonehenge and the automatons and all that stuff, ultimately, it's still paid off as a father trying to keep his son from watching a TV commercial as he knows children throughout the country are dying. Yeah. It paid off on what it's set up. Yeah, and there's some striking imagery in there that paid off better than anything in this. And there were some interesting sequences and some interesting ideas. It did things that were unexpected and that you had never seen before. Mm -hmm. This has the pumpkin patch scene. Yeah. It's amusing, but it feels like it should be a Mr. Bean sketch. Yeah. You asked me early on, why do I want to watch this? And I still want to kind of see it just to see what sort of shit show it would have been if they had actually had made it. I'm glad we don't live in that universe where it was made. Again, I think the germ of the idea, Halloween has been banned. 
This tension has risen without a release. Parents versus children, the iconography of Michael, everyone stealing costumes of Michael so that they can all dress as Michael and take on that iconography that leads to this mass conflict. I want that film. Mm -hmm. I would love to see someone take on that idea. And just go wild with it. Go nuts with it. Yeah. You could even take Halloween 2018 and do a sequel to Halloween 2018 that uses that idea. It's one of those great things where you could pretty much drop that anywhere in the franchise. Whether you mm -hmm. bring the killer back or not, you can run with that idea in some really... You don't even have to tie it to a franchise. A killer that had an iconography that people are building around. I think it's more effective if you're using it in a franchise that has its own established iconography. But it's still a concept that you could really make work in some interesting ways as this town just goes nuts. Yeah. As just this exploration of hysteria. And, you know, even that goes to like what happened in Salem and all that stuff where you had this built up tension with no release and everything just went to shit. Mm -hmm. Play that out. Have fun with it. Make it wild. Make it twisted. Make it dark. Look at the movie Mom and Dad, where it's about parents who all turn on their kids. You can go wild with that. It's a ballsy concept that you can go wrong with if you go too far in the wrong directions. But it's also a concept that you can make a really, really strikingly satirical horror film out of. Yeah. I do not begrudge that concept, but that concept is not what we got from this script. No. This script, I would throw in the trash. Yeah. I would give Edgerson a story credit and have the script completely rewritten and never read this again. Yeah. There's enough good ideas that I think a different writer could have expanded yeah. upon it. I don't think Etchison either has the skill or the interest, I'm not sure, to develop it into something that is actually usable as a screenplay. Even John, I don't think, would have really pulled off that scale. Because the bigger you get in scale, John starts to struggle more because he's more very really lean, tight in. Like, even The Thing has a big cast, but it's very closed in, and that cast diminishes as the story goes along. Yeah. Whereas, again, Joe Dante, if you had taken that concept and had Joe bring in some of the writers he's worked with and flesh that concept out, you could have had... Have like a proto scream, you know. I mean, this is a you know, this yeah. is a concept that you could make a scream movie out of where kids are using the iconography of Ghostface Killer and the entire town decks out that iconography as it turns on itself. You could make a great scream movie out of this, yeah. It does almost feel like a bad prototype to a scream film, like I yeah. said, with all the horror references, with all this meta textual, the effect of horror films on people. But unlike Scream, which actually was well-made, well-written, and actually had a point to all of it, this just feels like indulgence. And, in, well, these are all movies I like, and so I'm just going to include them all in the film. Yeah. Not actually have anything to say about them or do anything as far as, like, the tropes that are involved with them. We're just going to include the references to them. And that's good enough. And that's just lazy. This is what it is. It would have to be a page one rewrite. You can't even just go in and like make tweaks here and there because you would have to remove the entire third act. You'd have to remove all the stuff of the supernatural Michael coming back. Even if you just stripped out the third act and you stripped out the pumpkin scene and you redid the death of the mini Mart, if you have a third act that actually plays off what you've been setting up, mm -hmm. again, restage it to the dance, have it all the teenagers break out their shape costume, hijack the dance, doesn't go over well with the parents, all this tension finally explodes in a big melee, just redo the third act. Then you could take the first 60 pages and just make revisions here and there. I would give it a complete overhaul just because you want to redevelop the characters more. Yeah. But yeah, this is one of those ones where it's like even looking at how could you take this and fix it? You got to break down all the walls, rebuild the foundation. It's the foundation is okay, but you got to build an entirely new house on top of it. Yeah. It is that broken of a script. And again, I don't like getting vitriolic because, you know, there's a lot of things I like that other people hate. I love the Super Mario Brothers movie. I love Star Trek V. Yeah. I'm pretty good at being able to be like, this isn't working. You fix this, this and that. And it works. This is one. You can't just do that. It is such a misguided choice yeah. that you literally have to throw it out and rewrite it from the bottom up. Yeah. It, to be honest, the best thing about this thing is it gives me a whole new appreciation for the actual Halloween 4. Yeah. Which is not a bad film. It's not great, but it has good moments in it. And it was successful. And it was success. Yeah. And it is a watchable film. This, like I said, I kind of want to hate watch it. I kind of want to visit that universe where this was made just to hate watch it. I don't think it would be a good film. I couldn't recommend it to anyone. It is no. something that just needs to be, for the most part, forgotten. I remember how excited people were when the script finally surfaced because we had heard about the Dennis Etchison draft for years. And then he even brought it up in an interview. And then like five months later, I don't know if he leaked it himself or not, but suddenly the script is making the rounds. 
suddenly you saw a lot of horror sites be like, oh my God, we could finally read the Dennis Etchison script. And like within a day, it's like, here's why it's probably not a good idea to track down the Dennis Etchison yeah. script. <laughs> Yeah. I've read other people who did reviews of the Etchison script. It doesn't have any fans. It is not a lost masterpiece. It is not a what could have been. It is literally everything fell apart for John. In one last desperate move, he was like, fine, we'll do another Michael movie. And then gave it to a writer who had no idea what he was doing. Yeah. And did nothing to help that writer in any way. And then they sent that script to the studios who were like, no. And so John washed his hands of it. He sold his share of Halloween. He left it behind. The Akkads went off somewhere else and they made Halloween 4. And for all its flaws, it is a watchable, enjoyable enough slasher movie. And Mm -hmm. it was a financial success and led to them doing more. I mean, I think if this had been made, it would probably end up like Halloween 5. Halloween 5 is terrible. (laughs) But it's well shot, has a good score, and a decently played Michael. This, I can't even say that. Well... It doesn't have cinematography or score because it's on paper. Yeah, but I can't even imagine, like, good cinematography and score saving this film. Just because, for one thing, the special effects budget on this would have been so huge that it would be unrealistic. Oh, I don't think it would be because, I mean, look at the budget that Killer Clowns was made on. Uh, That was a super low indie budget movie, and yet they pulled off some really impressive visuals, including a giant clown in a miniature set. And maybe it's just because of the fact that I'm not passionate about this. I can't imagine some special effects person being passionate enough to go like... I can imagine a cheap, shitty version of this. Yeah, I was going (laughs) to say, like, I have a feeling if they filmed it the way that it's in the script, and I have a feeling, like, in practice, if Joe Dante or whoever ended up directing this, they would have probably thrown out good chunks of this just because either the budget wouldn't be there or they'd just be like, this doesn't make sense. We're just going to wing it. You can pull off a lot of ambitious stuff with a low budget with just solid filmmaking. Again, like... Lost Boys was an $8 million movie. It was a super cheap movie to do. The Elm Streets, like, around this time, you would have had Elm Street 4, which has some of the most striking visuals and makeup design. I think it was Screaming Mad George and Steve Wayne did the makeup for that. Beautifully shot movie, very striking, very visual, was still done for about $10 million. Mm-hmm. A good filmmaker can work a low budget and make it look twice as much as it costs. Well, I think a lot of the times that happens because, again, like they have the passion for it. There's yeah. special effects guys who maybe work cheaper than they should because they believe in the project. It's an interesting project that allows them to do interesting. I mean, again, yeah. Screaming Mad George and Steve Wang did a lot of movies like that, like Society, like the Reanimator movies, where it's mm-hmm. not a huge prominent film, but it allows them to do some really imaginative, weird stuff. Right. And it gets their name out. But I don't see like anybody looking at this going, yeah, this is going to be the film that's going to, like, I'll work cheap for this because... Well, and even then, what kind of effects are we talking about? Because there's no real like gore effects. You have the hand regenerating. The whole Michael getting big, you just do that with a miniature set. That's not really that big of a thing. The really only prominent special effects sequence in this movie is the flesh house. Yeah. And the girl slitting her skin off. And and, yeah. yeah. But even then, that's a sequence that doesn't need to be in the story. Yeah. And it's also, I've seen similar stuff in the Elm Street films. Oh, the opening to this is straight out of the opening of Dream Warriors, where she's in the nightmare house and the giant Freddy snake is chasing her. Yeah. Part of it is just, I just don't want this film to exist. Like, as much as I said, I want to hate watch it. I'm just trying to come up with excuses as to why it could not be made, because it should not be made. It shouldn't really be forgotten. There's no reason why this should have been made. Yeah. That's the big thing is, yes, it would have been cool to have John continue to be involved with the Halloween films, to have his own idea of Halloween for Dennis Etchison as a popular writer, the two of them working together is an intriguing idea. But then you see what comes of it. And this is just, it's a terrible script. Yeah. Dennis Etchison, I think, is just, he's not for me. He has his fans. Kudos to you. I know he has good stuff, but some of those short stories were really good. Kudos to you. I'm glad you've had a good career, Dennis. I'm glad people enjoy your work. I am not among that fandom. I have not enjoyed the work that I have been exposed to. And I did not enjoy this script. And I am not going to feel bad about saying that. I wish you no ill will. I am glad this script was not filmed. Yeah, I I have to agree 100%. I've enjoyed talking about it with you, but I would not enjoy reading this film. I would not probably enjoy watching the film other than just a gleeful hate watching type way. This is the most vitriolic I've gotten in a podcast since My Bloody Valentine 3D, (laughs) which is going to be funny because we have an upcoming screenplay from the writers of My Bloody Valentine 3D. Oh, goody. (laughs) Oh... 
So I think that's going to bring our Genocrypha episode to a close. As I said, we've got more Halloween stuff coming up. Not going to tell you all what it is, but we have some really fun surprises in store. So anything else you want to add, J.D.? No, other than fuck you for making me read this. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks, Noel. Well, that wasn't me. That was the shape holding my head and neck <laughs> and causing my body to rub up and down like a Barbie doll. He's <laughs> just slamming your head against the keyboard and that sent an email. That's how internet sex works. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> uh... Well, have a good night thinking about that. Good night. <laughs> Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>